Good morning. Uh, sitting here this morning, I'm just thinking about uh, some of the great things God's done for us and um, uh, have this uh, just a thank you note that was sitting over here. And this is from Dr. Tom Williams and his wife. And um, I just got thinking about how uh, just what an amazing ministry God has allowed us to have, not that we're anything special, but he has done some special things for us. Um, and going back, um, I'm not sure when Tom Williams first came, but um, it was just after our fifth anniversary. Um, I can kind of date things by the color of the tent. And when Brother Williams came the first time, if I remember right, we were in a red and white tent. And uh, that was the first tent we got from Dennis Coral. And it was old and uh, it was pouring down rain and wind blowing and we get pretty high winds here sometimes not every year but uh, 50 60 mile an hour winds are not rare it would not be every year but and and, and higher than that but i remember brother williams is he, he's he's there preaching and um and a big chunk of the tent just blew out, just gone, like maybe a three foot wide piece of the tent just blew out and the building was building. The tent was full of people and um, people just moved their chairs over and the rain poured in and, and he kept preaching. And the next, uh, the next day, a couple of the men put some tarps up at that hole and taped it, uh, sort of taped it and and um, they didn't seal it watertight, but at least the rain didn't pour straight in. And um, that was uh, one of the first times, I think it was the first time Brother Williams was with us. And, and he's been with us many times over the years. And, uh, his, um, his wife that was with him then had had um, spinal meningitis. And, and she was, oh, maybe like a grade schooler. You know, she would talk some, but not, not on a, an adult level. But she had a quick sense of humor, and she was she was had some quick sarcasm, and so there were you know little sprinkles of of adult humor that came along, but uh, pleasure to have um, men like Brother Williams uh, in our church in those early days, helping shape and fashion the ministry. There's a man from India that came, Jacob Chelly, and he was reached many many uh, years prior. Uh, American missionaries had reached his parents, and so he grew up in a good independent Baptist church, but he was in business as a young man and had a, a good job in, in India. And so as an adult with a successful career around him, Jacob Chelly then surrendered to the ministry, and by the time we met, he was in Bangalore, which is kind of middle uh, India, and uh, Jacob Chelly had a huge ministry. He'd started several hundred uh, Baptist churches and had a college there. And, and he was, uh, and so our church is still, because of the property we lived on, I remember where we were on that property till our 10th anniversary. From a, we were on that, moved on that property about our fifth anniversary, moved off about our 10th, around our 10th anniversary. And he was saying, uh, Brother Goddard, you need to come and, and teach in my college and, and come for two or three months. And, and I thought, I got this young church. I'm not going to leave for two or three months. I mean, even to this day now, 41 years later, I think only once have I ever missed uh, three services, uh, like three Sundays or three Wednesdays. I don't think we've ever missed three Sundays, but we have missed three Wednesdays. Just a couple of years ago, my wife and I took some time and we missed a Wednesday, a Sunday, a Wednesday, a Sunday, and the next Wednesday, I think we came back. But to be gone three weeks is unheard of. It just never happened. Pretty much all the ministry, we've never even missed two Sundays, uh, let alone multiple months. But, but and then he said, now, if you come, you need to be able to, uh, we'll, we'll probably need to cast out some devils and do some demons and told about his wife being bit by a cobra and, and one thing or another. I thought, well, I'll just keep praying for you and send some money. But again, this was an older Christian. I remember him. Uh, he stayed in our home and he was up early in the morning reading his Bible for a long time. And... Um, and if I remember right, he said he reads his Bible through multiple times a year, is regimented. I, I want to say it was once a month, but it might have been every other month. But um, I think he was the first one that challenged me to read lots of Scripture and to believe in the power of God. And he told stories of what God had done in India. And 
Um, then another, uh, another great person that we got to rub shoulders with was Howard Jewell. Uh, you can look up Howard Jewell. Um, he's on YouTube and in the internet, and you can find him. Howard Jewell was, uh, I, I want to say he traveled with some of the Billy Sunday crowd or that crowd just after Billy Sunday. But he was in the early 1900s. He was a soloist. And he, uh, he was just an amazing guy. And by the time we met, his wife had had a stroke. And she couldn't speak clearly, but she was all there mentally. And she could sing with him. She'd sing simple songs with him. But Howard Jewell would sing. And what a, he, he wouldn't preach. He said, I'm not a preacher. I'm an exhorter. But he'd sing, and then he'd preach. Um, then he'd sing, and then he'd preach, and sing and preach. But what a pleasure to be around him. And talked much about the family altar, family Bible and prayer. And, um, and, he, and he talked about just having joy, the joy of serving God, the joy of going on in the faith. And, and Dr. Howes had had Howard Jewell at pastor school. What a pleasure he was. But he's in our tent, and he was just as excited about the things of God in our old tent on a dirt road with a dirt parking lot as he was in that big, beautiful building in Hammond, Indiana. But thinking through the, the missionaries and the preachers that that have visited us and, and encouraged and helped us. We've been very blessed. And I hope you wouldn't take lightly the people that cross your path, spiritually speaking. Um, there are some people that, that, uh, that we may just be around them for a day or a week or maybe once in a while, one, you know, once now and then over a series of years. Don't, don't lose the, the wonder of great Christians and I look back as, as far as church members go, and, and I don't want to ever forget the great workers that, uh, that helped our church. And they weren't necessarily preachers or traveling evangelists or anything, but they were people with a heart, and they served here. And I, I don't want to forget them. They, some of them are in heaven. Some have moved out of the area. Um, they don't have to still go to our church for me to be grateful for their influence. I was thinking about Joe Boyd. Um, again, he's in heaven now, and Brother Williams is still alive. He sent me a text just the other day. I'd sent a text to him, let him know I was thinking about him, and praying for him, and he, he and his wife, Janine, they, um, they sent a text back thanking me for all the years of friendship. But um, Joe Boyd was, was here, and Joe Boyd was a, he is a big old hulk of a man, and even up into his 70s, and what, a, what an exciting guy. And he traveled the country, much of it, on a, in a bus, and... Um, he was at our church several times, and, and uh, what a pleasure to be around him. He, he was explaining habits and things, that, that, and I didn't grow up with habits. I didn't grow up in, in Sunday school, but I grew up in a good home, and um, I really didn't have any, any habits other than I liked to eat and, and I liked sports. And, but um, Joe Boyd smoked. He said, I think he was 27, somewhere in his mid-20s, late-20s, when he surrendered to preach. And that's when he quit smoking. And, and again, this is, you know, 30-year-old story, so it's not going to be exact. But basically, he said um, he, got, he, uh, he surrendered his life to preach and uh, got rid of his cigarette somewhere along in there. And, and he, said, um, uh, he said, I could still walk by a person smoking, and they're smoking. And I just walk by them and breathe. That he said, I can just smell that cigarette smoke in my mouth of water for a cigarette. He said, after all these years, it's still, uh, it's still a tantalizing thing. And I thought, oh, that's terrible. And not that he was tempted to start smoking, but it just smelled good. He liked the smell of it. And um, uh, but he, Joe Boyd was out soul winning with me, and um, he said we were following up on some prospects and just out to together and. And he said, now, if, we got, if God got us this neighborhood, there's a reason. So he said, let's just don't get back in the car. Even if no one's home, let's don't get in the car until we talk to at least two people. And that was, so that became a soul winning um, general rule of thumb. You're going to make a visit and, and the person's not home. Maybe they came to church or Sunday school class, or whatever. They, well, walk around the neighborhood at least till you talk to a couple people because somebody in that neighborhood is there that God wants you to talk to. And we're coming back from um, following up on people, and I, and I went by the house of Bob Coates. Bob's been in heaven for some years now, but, but um, I'd been visiting Bob for about a year and uh, witnessing to him now and then, trying to talk to him, and, and he, had, 
Uh, he's just a great guy. Uh, but he, he, he'd pick up fruit here and there and sell it. Him and his neighbor, next door neighbor, they'd sell fruit at their front yard at a fruit stand. And, um, and, they, and he didn't have a regular job. He just did that. Well, we went uh, with, with Joe Boyd. We went to, to Bob Coates, and he happened to be at, at the house, and, and we talked for a while and, and uh, knelt right there on the, the back porch of his house, and Bob Coates trusted Christ. And there's a lot to the story, a lot of great lessons in it. But, but Bob got saved, and he came that night. We had a horse trough, and uh, it was at Clint Miller's house. Miller, the Millers were members of our church at the time, just a businessman, and he later pastored. But um, I had led Brother Miller and his family to Christ um, not, long, not long before that, but we, we had a, a difficulty with the tent trying to get it all up and running, so we moved the service to the Miller's home, and we put the horse trough up on their patio, and Bob Coates got baptized up there in a horse trough on the back patio, and the Millers let us pack their house out with people, and Joe Boyd preached. But, um, but uh, Bob Coates became one of our bus drivers, one of our, our most faithful soul winners, and, and just a, a great Christian man. But again, all these people that cross our paths, don't, don't take lightly um, a godly Christian man or woman that, that crosses your path uh, in the early days of our church, I mean the early weeks of our church, I met Mabel Miller and Louise Johnson. Mabel and, Lu and uh, Louise were Moody College students in the, I'm going to say in the 20s, and um, they were at uh, the Moody Bible Institute uh, when uh, Dr. McLaren, I think, was the pastor at the time, but or he was a pastor near there. Uh, he wasn't at Moody Church, but he was at a church near there in, in the Illinois area. And they would go to the college, but they told stories of, of the pastor renting a bus on Sundays. The city buses didn't run on weekends or on Sundays, but he'd rent a bus and a driver. And that bus, because Mabel said, if we're having special meetings, I'm, she didn't drive. And she said, I'd, I'd be ashamed if I didn't have a convert under both arms, bring him into church. And, and um, so she'd be walking people to church, seven, five, 10, 15, 20, sometimes 25 people. She's walking, all of them following her to church, children, teenagers, adults. And so the pastor started renting a bus for her. And uh, that's early bus, early days of the bus ministry in Chicago. Um, but Mabel Miller, um, she was the, uh, I got to visit her a little bit. And, and Louise, by the time I met, Louise had had a stroke and she was, I never heard her speak. She'd lie in bed. But whenever we'd go there, I'd go back with Mabel and we'd visit Louise in her room and talk a little bit. And Louise wrote poetry and, and music. And, and Mabel was, uh, they're just great Christian ladies. They gave their, when they were at college, they decided we would not marry, but we will give our lives to soul winning and soul winning in particular to Jewish people. And that's what brought them to our area because when we started the church, there were a lot of Jews in our area. The older people who during World War II had moved out of the city to this area, uh, if you from our, that live in our area at the, at the end of Main Street in downtown where it hits the lake, there's a little village kind of a place, bunch of uh, duplexes. And that was all Jewish people. And when we got here, it was still lots of Jewish people there. And one of our uh, first uh, Jewish converts was out of there, and uh, Harry Osef. But, um, but Mabel and Louise were great Christians. And Mabel, well, she didn't get out very much. They were, they were very old. But she'd sit on her front porch. When people walked down the street, she'd call them over to her and say, excuse me. And you'd get them over, and, and she'd lead them to Christ. Then she'd call me and say, Pastor, I got another one here for you to go visit or for you to pick up to go to church. And, and uh, what a blessing, uh, the great, great Christians. She, she, I'd come by and she'd give me a book, and, and many of my books that say Mabel, and Louise, Mabel Miller and Louise Johnson. And um, she said, I'm going to get you a good library because I, know the, I knew the authors. So she said she was old enough. She knew who wrote what books. And, and some of my best books she gave me uh, to this day, books that I would still use. Um, but they came from Mabel Miller, a very unknown and unsung hero. But, but these two ladies gave their, gave their whole lives to soul winning and decided to not marry, to not have their own families. They were going to be soul winners and uh, great Christians. I'm so thankful that God um, lets us brush uh, lives, just cross paths here and there with exceptional Christian people. Of course, both my pastors were that way. But I wanted to take a moment today and, and, and just, just briefly remind you of the great work of the church and what is it that we're supposed to be doing here. And um, 
I'm going to take a, a passage, a, a, a tad out of context, but um, just taking a, a, a word or two here about this, uh, this work of, of what is the church supposed to be? What's the pastor supposed to be? What, what, are, what is our goal here? What are we trying to accomplish? And in, in Ezekiel 34, um, he's, he says in verse 2, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. And so he begins by saying, woe to you shepherds, you people that should have been looking after the flock. Um, and you're selfish and you're fat and you're greedy and, and you let these people suffer and you're not looking after people. And he really, really scolds them. Um, and then um, he goes down a little bit further and I just take one verse in verse 16. And this summarizes to me the work of the church and the work of the pastor uh, especially the pastor, but the work of the church as a whole. This I preached on this our first Sunday night in uh, August of uh, August, I think, 28th of, um, of uh, 1982. The first Sunday night, I uh, had a handful of people there, and I said, I just want you to understand, this would be what I believe our church's purpose should be, our goal, what should we seek to do. And in uh, verse 16, he says, number one, I'll seek that which is lost. I'll seek that which is lost. The church must stay a soul-winning church, seeking. Not a, not a beautiful website, not that that's wrong, not a welcome sign, not that that's wrong, um, but seeking the lost. Not going out trying to find the people who are already saved that are out of church, which is that's nothing wrong with that, but the great work of the gospel is to seek lost people. And we've got to keep that. We have, we have, we've kept it fresh. And um, uh, we want to keep looking for people and witnessing and telling others. Secondly, in verse 16, I'll bring again that which is driven away. Do you know there are people that through a divorce or through some hurt, they got out of church. Maybe the, a family got all messed up and the kids ended up out of church for some years. And, and maybe a church problem went on. Churches have problems because they have people in them and um, some difficulty and someone got out of church or some misunderstanding took place or maybe somebody was too sensitive and, uh, and they overreacted and they said, I'm done with that church or I'm done with religion or whatever. Well, in a few months or a few years or a decade uh, pass and they realize I need to be in church. Uh, just recently, uh, I got a chance to talk to somebody who'd, who's been a year out of church and um, and I, I got a hold of him and, and he said, oh, thank you for calling and thank you for caring. He said, I've just kind of had enough burdens. I've, he, and he did, he had some burdens and we'll look at that in a moment. But, but uh, he said, I'm, I'm, I just need to be back in church. And, uh, but he says, number one, I'll seek the lost. Number two, I'll bring again that which is driven away. There are people in, in our communities all across America, they, were, they got saved somewhere along the way and, and something happened and uh, their family or their parents or their kids or their friends or their church or their pastor or whatever, uh, the economy, their health. I know people who get out of church because just tragedy strikes in their home um, and they get out of church and, and the trouble drives them or stupid people drive them. And uh, you, you know, some people don't like me saying stupid, but I think some people are stupid. And uh, whatever you want to say about that, it's up to you. Don't you say it if you don't like it. But... Um, but, but to people that are, are heartless, people that are thoughtless, they're not, they don't intentionally hurt people, but they just say things that are ridiculous that nobody should say. Um, and so these people, they're driven. And, and, and he says, number one, I'm going to seek the lost, but I'll tell you what else, there's some people out there that are saved, and I'm going to bring them again. I'm going to bring them again, and I want them back in church, and we care about it. Number three, third goal of the church is to bind up that which is broken, and that's the guy I started to mention a minute ago. There are people whose life's broken, the death of a loved one, a divorce, uh, some tragedy that uh, they're just broken. And, and so we've got the lost we see, then we've got those that are driven away, we bring them again, and then they're just hurting people. They're all over the place. And, and we, the church, we should be concerned about hurting people. This is a messed up world, and, and there's people all around us who are hurting, and um, we ought to be the ones bringing the balm of Gilead, that healing presence of God to heal the wounded soul. And our church ought to always be a healing place, a place that cares. And that's one of the reasons we go to jails and rest homes, but just going into the homes of, of broken lives. And then lastly, 
He says, and I'll strengthen that which is sick. Um, the church ought to be concerned about sick people and visiting the sick and praying for the sick and seeing if we can help them somehow. We're not doctors, but maybe I can bring some groceries or maybe I can do something for, but just caring about people. There are people, their health has caused them to be invalids there, maybe in convalescent homes. Um, we've had people go to convalescent homes and they die there. Um, they can't get back to church. Those people, um, we got to do what we can to help the sick. And so um, that there are people who are stay home and maybe they have in-home health care, whatever. Uh, maybe they're on hospice. And uh, we ought to keep our eyes open, pay attention. I was at one of our church members' home and they said, you know, my neighbor across the street is dying. And if you wouldn't mind stopping by. And I said, oh, no, I'll stop by. And, and they were at, literally at the last days, maybe weeks. And I knocked on the door there. They were Catholic. And I knocked on the door and, and told them who I was. I'm your neighbor's pastor. And, and uh, I know you're facing some grief. Any chance um, would, it, would it be a help in any way? Would you like me to stop for a minute and pray with your family and pray with your loved one? They brought me right in. I stood there next to a bed. I think it was a, like a hospital bed in the living room and stood by the bed and, and uh, told them some scripture, talked a little bit about Jesus and salvation and heaven and, and, and prayed with them. You know, that didn't hurt anything. Uh, that didn't take a whole lot of time. But there are people out there that need someone. He, he says, I'll strengthen that which is sick just to breathe some strength into those people. And uh, we, we ought to care. Now, let's not sit home saying, I wish someone would come and look up. No, that's called selfishness. But, but as a church, we ought to be caring, um, just caring. There's somebody whose who's spouse dies. Oh, they're going to sit home. And uh, those are difficult hours, difficult weeks, months, years. Um, they need some attention. They need somebody to, to, to bring them some courage to, to keep on. And so um, it's not the praise band and it's not the, uh, the uh, drums and electric guitar. That, that's a big thing about church. It's not the big Gothic cathedral. It's not the... The, the ball games, uh, it, that's not, it's not even a Christian school. Now, those other things, we don't have much of that, but, but we do have a Christian school. Uh, Jesus didn't start a school. He started a church. And, and he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And uh, let's, let's don't lose that number one focus. What is the church all about? What is it we're supposed to be doing? And, and let's keep our, our hearts tuned to the real purpose of the work of God. These verses, if I didn't, have, didn't tell you, Ezekiel 34 and verse, verse 16, and there's more in that chapter. And, and God really scolds the shepherds. He said, you shepherds, you've not been out visiting. You've not been out looking for people. And shame on the preachers who never spend any time in people's homes. Um, Thursday, I think I got home about 10 o'clock Thursday night. And uh, seeing people here and here and ended up at this home, didn't get to that home till uh, 8 o'clock. And and uh, that was somebody that's coming to our church. And it was 9.30 before, 9.40 before I left the house and, and got home to my house about 10. Um, people matter. And uh, preachers, uh, if a preacher won't get out and spend time with people, I don't, I mean, unless he's crippled or something very unusual, I don't have much use for the guy. Uh, we need to be out and, and care about people and, and love people and find out people's hurts and, and needs. And then we need to win the lost and give them the gospel. I uh, talked to a, uh, a guy on, uh, on a Friday just at the dry cleaners and then walked out of the dry cleaners and there's a guy and his family getting in a car and they'd had a donut or something from the donut shop next to dry cleaners. And I went over and said, and the guy opened the window and I said, hey, since God put you and me both in the same parking lot. And that was my opening line. And, and we talked for quite a while about the gospel and about the church. Got two little kids. And uh, you know, and I, I, I didn't, they didn't get saved, didn't get all that far, but they were gracious. And let's talk to people and let's find out where people are and what their needs are. That's the great work of the church. And again, you that go to other churches, if, you're, if your pastor didn't get out and spend time with people and seek the lost, I'm not being critical of your pastor, but I would suggest you find another church. And again, maybe, maybe somebody's old and they can't walk very well or whatever, but, but we ought to think this thing through. The great work of the gospel is to go into all the world and preach that gospel and tell people the good news. And, and I hope we have a great week. Pray, pray that God will bless uh, our church, your church, if you go to a different church. And let's, let's seek 
the lost. Let's bring again that which is driven away. Let's bind up that which is broken. And, and let's bring some strength and healing to the sick and to try and be a help to them as well. And may our churches fulfill the great work God's called us to do.